Hello, and uh, welcome to lecture number 18 in uh, the series in Cognitive Neuroscience. Um, we are moving out of discussing research methods, mostly, <laughs> um, and moving into talking about what's called hemispheric specialization. And this basically has to do with um, how the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain might be specialized for some particular uh, tasks or processes. Uh, in this first uh, lecture, there's two on this topic. Uh, we're going to do a little myth busting about left brain versus right brain. Most of what you hear uh, anywhere is um, based entirely in outdated or completely incorrect views of the brain. So we're going to start there, and then we'll talk a little bit about some anatomical differences. And in particular, I want to talk a little bit about sex differences um, in uh, cerebral asymmetry. When we talk about something being asymmetrical, we just simply mean that one side of the brain is greater than the other in terms of its size, in terms of its um, functionality. So um, there's cerebral asymmetry in language, uh, comprehension and production, primarily left hemisphere task, um, right hemisphere, a little bit more visual spatial, uh, etc. First thing I do want to uh, quick note that uh, we didn't talk much about when I was talking about neuroscience methods is be cautious when interpreting a lot of neuroscience research because uh, it's almost entirely conducted with right-handed participants. In fact, uh, a great deal of neuroscience research is uh, conducted with left-handedness being a limitation that you're not allowed to participate. So it's an exclusionary criteria to that research. Uh, that's done to reduce variance in the data uh, makes for cleaner, neater data, but it also makes for inaccurate data, as far as I'm concerned. So I think it's an important limitation. Um, we need to understand that some left-handed participants show reduced asymmetry in function. So they show, in some ways, a little bit more bilaterality, uh, in particular with things like language. Um, not all, about 30% of left-handed participants show that kind of reduced asymmetry. And finally, and I think this is also an important note, is males are more likely to be left-handed than females. About 13% of males are left-handed, where I think it's about 7% of females are left-handed. We're going to talk about uh, why that might be as we get towards the end of this talk, uh, but it does appear primarily to be due to the presence of prenatal androgens, because that laterality is associated with other biomarkers, and then we'll also get into some discussions of sexual orientation and how it's related to that uh, as well. So a little myth busting about the left brain, right brain. Right hemisphere is not more creative. This is not the creative side of your brain uh, any more than the left side is logical or analytical. Now there is some left hemisphere association uh, with language, of course. Um, some mathematical abilities uh, are left versus right brained simply because of uh, that connection with uh, symbolic processing that's associated with language. And we're going to get into that more when we get to uh, later on in the semester. Biggest thing to understand is you can't train your brain to be more left brain, right brained. Don't buy those books. Don't spend any money on that nonsense. Um, for the most part, you really can't train your brain anyway. <laughs> There are things that can improve your cognitive functioning and preserve, more importantly, your cognitive functioning. And as we move through the semester, we're going to talk a little bit about some of those, exercise, diet, um, et cetera. There are some things that do appear uh, to um, improve a narrow ranges of tasks. You can get uh, a little bit better at a task, but that doesn't transfer for, to better brain functioning, yeah, brain functioning overall. And that's really important to understand. So let's get into what is different about the left hemispheres. Uh, they're more alike than not. So a lot of this is much ado about very little. I think that's important for you to understand. Uh, the right hemisphere is pushed a little bit more forward, a little bit more anterior. Uh, this particular view is exaggerated in some of its aspects, um, just to sort of give you a clearer idea. Uh, but the right hemisphere is a little bit more anterior. Uh, the right hemisphere has more volume in the uh, frontal lobe areas, the left hemisphere in the occipital lobe. This figure uh, is um, radiological protocols with right on the left and left on the right. A um, couple of things about that. Um, you would expect the frontal lobe to be a little bit larger on the right side because 
there's a little bit more room under the skull. So if you think about the fact that you know the left hemisphere is pushed back, a little more air, area for that right hemisphere to kind of push over. And the same with the occipital lobe in the back. You can see it's kind of pushed over the midline a little bit uh, on that uh, left hemisphere. Now, um, what's interesting about this is there really aren't any functions associated with these larger volume areas in frontal or occipital lobe. Um, most people are um, right hand dominant, and so we would expect the right visual field oftentimes to be used more because the right hand's doing more over in that right visual field. Uh, but uh, there's not a lot of functional difference here. There are some microscopic differences. So some structural differences in cell morphology and arrangement between the hemispheres and the language areas. Uh, the left hemispheres have a more higher order dendritic branching. And when we talk about higher order dendritic branching, it's sort of like when a uh, branch splits in two, then those two branches split off again, and then those that branches that have been created split off again. Those are higher order branches. So a first order branch would be the first time it splits, a second order would be uh, after it splits after the first split. Uh, it's sort of like the difference between like an elm tree and uh, a pine tree. Pine trees tend to have only first and second order branching, uh, whereas uh, more deciduous trees like an elm tree uh, have um, a more uh, higher order branching. And so there is more dendritic branching in the left hemisphere than in the right. Uh, particularly within Wernicke's area in the left hemisphere, the columns are a little bit further apart, um, providing a potential for expansion of functioning, more connected, more um, potential for growth as we um, experience language. There are also cell size differences in both anterior and posterior language cortex. Uh, a little bit larger, particularly in the pyramidal cell layer in the left hemisphere compared to the right hemisphere. You can see the cell morphology difference is pretty clear here. Um, bottom uh, figure being the left hemisphere, the top being the right. So those are some differences between the hemispheres. Uh, I'm really more interested in functional differences because you can't really see a lot of f significant structural differences. And we're going to get into those mostly throughout the term because I prefer to talk about these issues um, within each topic. But uh, the corpus callosum, of course, connects the um, cerebral hemispheres. Uh, anatomically, it is divided into the splenum, the anterior portion. Then as we go forward, it goes to the body and then the genu. Um, the fibers that connect corresponding regions across the hemispheres are what we call homotopic connections. Um, so homotopic just simply meaning uh, connecting the same structures. Well, those connecting different regions are heterotopic, meaning different, uh, different areas, um, connecting those different connect areas um, across the hemispheres. So a, hetero a homotopic connection from the occipital lobe would travel um, to the opposite hemisphere, uh, also at the same region, whereas a heterotopic one might um, connect that um, right occipital lobe, say, somewhere else, the right, uh, left frontal lobe, something like that. Uh, these connections are importantly both excitatory and inhibitory. Um, that is, there are, there's information um, exchange across the hemispheres that includes uh, excitation as well as inhibition. And so the, right hemis the left hemisphere might be quieting the right hemisphere while it's trying to do something. Um, or if it's more dominant in a task, part of that dominance might be due to that inhibitory connection traveling across the corpus callosum. And that's an important part uh, for us to understand that um, when we sever the connectivity between the two um, brain halves in a split brain procedure, we might be reducing uh, inhibition from one side of the brain to the other. And so understanding that dynamic relationship gets to be very important. And fortunately, we have very good um, analytic tools with things like the Human Connectome Project, Diffusion Tensor Imaging, where we can look at excitatory and inhibitory connections. Finally, we have the anterior and posterior commissures. Um, here we have a look at the anterior commissure. It's located between the optic chiasm, which is right here. The optic chiasm will be an important part of our discussion. Uh, as it's generally, it's pretty much always intact in a split brain procedure, and that allows the information from your left visual field to travel to your right hemisphere, and your right visual field to travel to the left hemisphere. Um, this optic chiasm includes both ipsilateral and contralateral fibers, 
because each eye has information from the left visual field. So the uh, information from the left visual field from the left eye would stay ipsilateral to the, sorry, from the left eye to the left visual field would be contralateral to the right hemisphere, whereas the right visual field in the left eye would stay ipsilateral um, and vice versa. Um, we then have the uh, hypothalamus, and then we have here the anterior commissure. It's located between the optic chiasm, uh, connects the temporal lobes as well as the left and right amygdala. And remember, the, the amygdala are those almond-shaped structures involved in emotional processing. And then you can see actually further posterior is the corpus callosum itself. Posterior commissure is quite small. Um, really, biggest thing it does is it carries fibers for the consensual pupillary response. So if I shine a bright light in your right eye, your left eye should construct as well. If it does not, then that means there's probably damage to the structure. Um, so those are all important parts of, oops, sorry, I'm flipping around here. Um, these are all important parts of how the cerebral hemispheres are connected um, at various points. Um, so the optic chiasm is sort of technically also connectivity across the hemispheres. It really doesn't connect the hemispheres. It connects the eyes to the different hemispheres. So anyway, um, that is uh, a little bit about cerebral connectivity. I do want to talk a little bit about sex differences in cerebral asymmetry because now we start to get into some structural differences. And before I get too far into this, I do want to um, say a few things about sex differences in the brain. I think well, oftentimes they are overstated. Um, and whenever we talk about sex differences of any kind, we're talking about average differences, not your brain versus somebody else's brain. Um, so that's important for us to understand. So we're talking about the average difference between um, males and females, but this is an overlapping distribution. And most people have brains that are very similar to, uh, most males have brains that are generally fairly similar to most uh, females' brains. Because there's a lot of overlapping in those distributions. Now, that being said, there are some observable differences. And um, they are, can potentially be important. So some very recent work uh, indicate that males and females may, uh, may differ in um, connectivity, with males showing greater intrahemispheric connectivity and females showing greater interhemispheric connectivity, um, which is a really fascinating study. This is a study from the proceeding of the um, National Academy of Sciences. And so here you can see uh, in the upper part of this figure, um, uh, connect, uh, connectivity maps uh, for male participants, and you see a lot more intra-hemispheric or within-hemispheric connections, whereas with women you see greater um, inter-hemispheric connectivity. Now, of course, there's always the potential for this to be um, due to some sort of selection bias in the research study, um, something along those lines. Uh, you can take a look at this and the Proceeding of National Academy of Sciences 2014, I'm not even gonna to try to pronounce that last name because I'll slaughter it. Um, but it's a pretty interesting study. There are also some letters that follow up with this controversy, so it might be worth taking a gander at if you're interested in it. Um, there are also possible asymmetries in the corpus callosum for males. That is, uh, there does seem to be sort of a greater uh, connectivity to the right hemisphere than the left. Uh, males also tend to show greater right hemisphere asymmetry, that is the right hemisphere tends to be a little bit larger than the left hemisphere. Uh, women tend to often times have larger left hemispheres than right. Um, this fits in with some behavioral data. We certainly know that women tend to be better at um, verbal tasks, language tasks. They learn language earlier, whereas males tend to be better at visual spatial tasks. Again, not everyone, and so I think it's a very important. if. Female has better, there are plenty of females, trust me, that have better um, visual spatial abilities, and there are plenty of males that have better verbal abilities. So this isn't, these aren't blanket considerations. These are sort of overall generalities. Anyway, there is some evidence that this is late, related to prenatal androgen levels that seem to predispose or reduce um, cerebral growth. That is, uh, the left hemisphere seems to grow uh, later during prenatal development than the right, and it seems to be susceptible to those increasing prenatal androgen levels in uh, males. Now, uh, 
there are a couple of other behavior correlates. Males are more likely to be left-handed, as I mentioned earlier. And remember, of course, the right hemisphere would be dom more dominant in a left-handed individual. Uh, there's also uh, some question about sexual orientation and possible asymmetry based on sexual orientation related to prenatal androgen levels. So one of the primary hypotheses about, uh, in particular, male homosexuality, but there is some evidence in terms of female homosexuality as well, indicating greater levels of prenatal androgen uh, levels, sorry, gre greater prenatal androgen levels um, causing this increase in uh, um, or this alteration in cerebral asymmetry, but also being associated with sexual orientation. Um, gay males are more likely to have more older brothers. Uh, they're sh likely to show biomarkers regarding uh, androgen levels. So there are very clear indications of prenatal androgen exposure, um, including uh, bone length, uh, a variety of other um, phenomena as well, including even penis size. So this is a fairly recent study, 2008, where they were, did some PET and fMRI studies looking at heterosexual males, heterosexual women, homosexual men, and homosexual women. Um, now, one of the things I want to caution you about in this particular realm is there is bias in some of the literature to try to describe gay males as having a feminized brain and gay women as having a more masculinized brain. And what we actually oftentimes see is that, well, um, uh, lesbian women do tend to often have what we would call a more masculinized brain. Um, gay males tend to often have what we call an over-masculinized brain. Um, and so while you can see grossly it looks like there is some relatively similar fun um, patterns of distribution for heterosexual women and homosexual men, you can see there are actually some pretty significant differences. And in fact, what you might notice is in the areas associated with heterosexual males, so if we look at the left amygdala versus the left amygdala in gay males versus straight males, um, pretty large differences you can see there. Uh, if you look at the right amygdala as well, so and actually what we might be looking at then is an overly masculinized brain. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. So what this all gets down to is there are some uh, biological differences in the brains of males and females. Um, one of the ones that uh, is talked about a lot is uh, size. Males have larger brains than females, but it's only because males have larger heads. <laughs> it has nothing to do with intelligence. Uh, in fact, uh, there is some evidence that females have uh, more densely packed brains. Essentially, the brain just fills up the available space. Um, and because males have heads on top of larger bodies, they're just overall larger in general. And so when you adjust for body size, there's really no difference. And so scenario, you have to be very cautious and very um, particular about the kind of research that you want to read because you have to be very careful and make sure that the research is done well and that there aren't, there isn't a clear bias in any of the conclusions about males or females in these kinds of studies. All right, well, that's a quick introduction to hemispheric asymmetry. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about split brain procedures and uh, investigations involving split brain patients.